All right, it is 6.02. Why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, I just want to welcome everyone to our event tonight, Youth Gone Wild, the intersection of music, art, and rebellion. I don't know about you, but I'm feeling a little rebellious these days after being uh, locked up at home for so long. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Taryn Edwards, and I am one of the librarians at the Mechanics Institute of San Francisco. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Mechanics, we are an independent membership organization that houses a wonderful library. You can see it right behind me. It is the oldest designed to serve the general public here in California and possibly the far west, um, not just serving those who wield a wrench for their day-to-day -day job. Um, we also are a cultural event center and so host lots of events like this every day in person and virtual. And we are a world-renowned chess club that is the oldest in the United States. So I encourage you to consider becoming a member with us. It's only $120 a year, and with that, you help support our contribution to the literary and cultural world of the San Francisco Bay Area. And um, it certainly is whirling these days as things start to reopen. So our event tonight will be moderated by Liam O'Donohue, who is the host and producer of the KPFA radio program and podcast, East Bay Yesterday. Our other speakers tonight include Samantha Durbin, who is a multi-talented uh, writer from Oakland, California, now living in the wonderful town of Golita. And she publishes all over the place, but recently published her debut book called Raver Girl, coming of age in the, in the 90s, um, which chronicles, um, from her perspective, the San Francisco Bay Area raver scene in the 90s. Um, we also have with us Jose Vadi, who is an award-winning essayist, poet, and playwright. He is the author of Interstate Essays from California, and his work has also appeared all over uh, the literary uh, magazine scene. Um, and last but not least, we have Mark Bishka. He joins us. He is the publisher and arts editor of um, the local news site, 48 Hills, and also the legacy alternative weekly, weekly paper, The Bay Guardian. Uh, in addition to being a writer, he also co-owns the stud bar here in the city. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I'm going to put people, our speakers links in the chat space. So if you um, want, you can copy and paste those uh, into uh, your browser to look at later. Um, and also information about how to uh, buy their books if you should want to. And I also want to encourage all of our guests to use our chat space. Um, if, they, if you have any questions, we will get to them at the end of the event. And we are recording this event so you can enjoy it again in a couple of days once I edit it and put it on YouTube. All right, I want to thank you all for coming. Thank all of our speakers for coming and take it away, Liam. And uh, I would like to thank you for hosting this event and uh, helping to put together this awesome panel of uh, so many great local writers who I really appreciate. And uh, just kicking things off, um, thinking about tonight's theme of sort of youthful, youthful rebellion, I was thinking back uh, on my own political trajectory um, because I was raised by a pretty conservative, uh, you know, Irish Catholic dad. My family wasn't that political, but from a pretty early age, I definitely gravitated towards uh, kind of anti authority Authoritarian, some I guess you could call it uh, broadly, and um, I know that the main thing that you know sent me in that direction from a pretty early age, like middle school, was music. Uh, I used to stay up watching shows like Yo MTV Raps in the '80s, late '80s, and uh, 
I, I specifically remember one of the first things that kind of jolted me out of my comfortable suburban uh, white existence was seeing the video for Public Enemies 911 is a joke. Uh, because not only did it make me aware that these public disparities that I had no idea about existed, but I mean, it, the beat was just so hard, like the music, it um, it got me so curious about like what they were all about. So I immediately went out and bought the tape, Fear of a Black Planet. It's one of the first tapes I ever bought. And um, that like sent me down a whole path of learning about like Malcolm X and the Black Panthers and all these things I'd never heard about in school. I mean, there was no <laughs> Black Panthers chapter uh, in my textbook, um, probably because I wasn't reading this textbook yet, uh, which we'll which we'll get to in a minute. This is Mark's book, Into the Streets, which I'll be uh, asking him about shortly. But, um, you know, from UMTV Raps, I got into punk, started going to punk shows, underground punk shows in Chicago, in the back of the club. It, I mean, I'm using the term club loosely. It was an old bowling alley, you know, that used to host bands in the corner for like $5 a pop and, you know, like let 15 year olds drink. Uh, but, you know, they were, they were, there was always people selling like Noam Chomsky books and Howard Zinn and uh, zines about ACT UP and the Riot Girl movement. Oh. Of course, my neighbors are doing construction right now. So I'm just going to close that window. Um, but uh, the point is that, you know, the, it was music, radical music that got me uh, sort of excited about politics. And I'm still excited about politics to this day and, and rebellion <laughs> to this day. Uh, so when I was approached about moderating a panel for these three authors, um, I immediately said yes. But at first I was kind of struggling how to frame the event because all their books are so different. But then I realized that one thing that unites uh, these three books, I'll, I'll hold up the other two right now to give everyone a little bit of love. Um, is the fact that they all really do deal with this theme of kind of youthful rebellion. And I think that's really fertile territory for discussion because it's really often dismissed as just, you know, naivete of the young or kids being kids, things like that. And I think that um, it's worth having an important, dis or, you know, a serious discussion about because at this moment in American history, there's obviously a lot on the line um, and we are gonna depend on the young, you know, young adults, the kids of this generation to um, help fix some of the things that people in our generations and the generations above ours uh, messed up so badly. Um, so um, yeah, what I'm getting at basically is I think that we can, I think history is important, that's my focus. Uh, I think that there's a lot that young people can learn from looking back at history. So hopefully, you know, people in my generation, sort of older millennials, Gen X type folks uh, can help sort of share, you know, pass on that legacy to the kids of today. But also, I hope there's some younger people uh, who are tuning in today or will watch this on YouTube later um, that can type in questions that we can respond to, because I think there's a lot that people in my generation, you know, people in their 30s, 40s, 50s and older can learn from the kids too. I mean, I see a lot of inspiration uh, in, in the younger generations kind of figuring out some things at a young age that, that I didn't get to understand until I was much, much older. So uh, hopefully we can get into that as well. Um, but I've rambled on long enough now. I'll start in with some of the Q&A and I wanna start with Mark because Mark, you're the only person who I haven't interviewed yet. I did a, a interview with Samantha on my podcast and also I talked to Jose live at Green Apple Books a couple months ago um, and I'll put links into the chat uh, of those conversations just so anyone who missed those can check it out um, and I'm also throwing in a link to a I didn't interview Mark I didn't interview you yet Mark but I did listen to an interview with you recently that I absolutely loved you had a great conversation with Vivian from the Rave to the Grave podcast one of my favorite podcasts where you share these just absolutely astonishing tales of throwing underground raves in Detroit in the 1990s. So um, again, I just put that in the chat. Hopefully um, people can check that out because it's a fascinating conversation. Um, but switching gears, um, like I said before, like I know you as a music guy, a rave guy, a music nightlife writer. So I was a little surprised when I saw that you were coming out with this book, Into the Streets, A Young Person's Visual History of Protest in the United States. Um, because that just felt like a little bit different than, you know, what I see you writing and tweeting about for the most part. So just starting things off, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about <laughs> what made you want to take on such a massive topic as the history of protest in the United States and why specifically you wanted to aim that topic at young people. 
Certainly, thank you so much um, for that great question. Um, it's a, a you know, it, it, I've been going to parties as a young person and a dancer and a raver since I was 14 in Detroit. And growing up in kind of a, a depressed industrial atmosphere like Detroit, um, which mixed white working class kids with black working class kids, um, you know, and kind of mixed the margins together. Every time we danced together was almost a political statement. So from the very beginning of my nightlife uh, going out, I, I really it was really intertwined with politics, um, which kind of guided my career to become a publisher of like an, an alternative weekly uh, with such a huge history of um, from the from the early 1960s uh, through the 2000s of of bolstering these kind of protest movements and everything like that. And um, you know, I had been a part of ACT UP in the 1990s, which was the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. Um, I was in the Detroit part, which was a little anemic compared to what was going on in San Francisco and New York. Um, but I still felt that I was politically active then. And as a person of Arab American descent, I was also going to college during the Gulf War. And so I became kind of activated to, towards that too. Um, it was a very interesting time then. So my activation into these things paralleled my rise in nightlife and going out and partying all night. So partying all night, protesting all day was the perfect thing I wanted to do. Um, and, you know, when I got a little bit older, I looked back and wanted to share some experiences. And I realized no one had written a uh, history of protest for young people, um, you know, that wasn't dry or, you know, that wasn't like just a history book. And I wanted to write something that was visually explosive because youth culture, visuals, images, it's such a huge part of protest, you know, from the very beginning of this country and before um, it. Uh, and so I wanted it to kind of pop. I wanted something that would be fun, express my own history and underground partying, et cetera, um, through this kind of, you uh, uh, kind of catchy uh, explosion of history. And while I was writing the book, um, I discovered that there were just tremendous pockets of youth culture that was driving um, the development, uh, the, the, the kind of awakening in this country to racial injustice, um, you know, to different, uh, you know, wonderful evolutions we've had in gender politics, the incredible turnout of young people against gun violence that we've seen, Black Lives Matter, which was driven by young people and youth culture. Um, and so I found that kind of mixed all my things together. So I wanted to write a history and I hope I did it justice um, for that. Uh, unfortunately, the book came out right before the um, January 6th insurrection. So I'm, hoping, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm hoping that we'll have a third edition that takes that into, into account. And I don't know exactly how I'm gonna write about that particular protest, but, um, but yeah, that's basically the story of the book. Well, speaking of follow-ups to the book, uh, this is a visual history, but, you know, as a music writer, you do, I'm, I know that you know a lot about protest music, so I was wondering if maybe that could be something that could accompany or supplement the next edition, like a history of protest music, because so often, um, like you said, it's like these youth movements, these student movements, they're kind of at the forefront, the vanguard of these various social struggles, and a lot of time, I mean, there's like an anthem that goes along with those different movements, right? Totally, exactly. You know, that was one of the great things about writing about the Black Lives Matter movement and Ferguson before that, which had kind of started um, the, the original hashtag was it was such an explosive, such a flowering of the hip hop community and really brought it to the fore. Um, uh, I was just thinking um, the other day, I, I was fortunate to be reporting on the Arab Spring in Tunisia while it was happening. And one of the most amazing things of that protest was the proliferation of hip hop. Um, and um, the United States has really set this template for protest music through hip hop um, and by extension through techno, after hours raves, extra legal parties, house parties um, that really capture the youthful spirit of rebellion as well as soundtrack actual events that are happening in the world. Absolutely. And for anyone who is not familiar, I will say there's a ton of great rap coming out of Morocco of all places right now. <laughs> so like the Middle Eastern hip hop world is like, I think, honestly, one of the most exciting places musically in the world right now. Um, so we were talking about raves a second ago, which is right up Samantha's alley with her book Raver Girl. And Sam, Mark was just talking a minute ago about sort of how going to underground parties as a teenager sort of politicized him and how they were a political act. I'm wondering if you could talk about that a little bit too. Do you feel like 
being a party kid, which some people might just see, see as like hedonistic or escapist, did that influence your political identity or the trajectory of how you kind of approach politics in the world in any way? Um, well, let's see. So I was born and raised in Oakland. Um, and so I kind of had, <laughs> had these stereotypical progressive Bay Area parents. Um, and so I was always raised, you know, with uh, my mom was like a feminist. And so she raised me as a feminist. My dad was an early tech guy and who had moved out of his house at 16, um, figured out his own way, dropped out of UC Berkeley, did acid with Owsley Stanley. So I was kind <clears throat> of already set up to be this like, open-minded um, kid. Uh, and so when I found rave culture, I was already also really into music. That was probably the main draw because I had already kind of heard this like techno music and, you know, um, there were a few things, you know, that really brought me into the culture, but um, I was also listening to Guns N' Roses when I was 10 years old. Um, and just, you know, I think being exposed to, yeah, MTV, right? MTV exposed us to a lot, um, that we, you know, as, as youngins, like, you know, there's so many exposure now, I feel like probably too much exposure. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so MTV was really the Holy grail of, you know, discovering these new, this new music and then in and then these new like lives you know these new cultures and um <clears throat> you know so even though I was an early Guns N' Roses fan I didn't become this like rocker girl I became a raver and I just think it really being in the Bay Area as a raver like it just solidified um my love for you know just kind of being being open-minded and being accepting and you know kind of like what Mark was saying like once you're out on the dance floor everyone is your friend everyone is equal we're all there like for the same purpose and it's just this unity that I did not feel at high school yeah yeah I, I mean that first wave felt. of raves had a really utopian outlook yeah. as well yeah because it was so yeah, fresh it was like yeah. Mid, yeah like mid 90s you know, there were kids from all over the Bay Area, like all different socioeconomic backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And I'd been exposed to a lot of that in Oakland, but I also was privileged. I grew up in the Oakland Hills, went to private schools. Mm -hmm. So for me, it exposed me, I would say more to that socioeconomic, um, the differences there and mm -hmm. um, really opened my mind to, to my privilege. Mm. and you know mm -hmm. and so you know being like what you didn't you know you didn't grow up going to the nutcracker in san francisco <laughs> like, so i think for me in terms of you know kind of a political outlook it was more that it was yeah. more you know kind of me realizing that i come from a privileged place and then opening my eyes to these friends who were not raised with you know so many opportunities but we were all equal and we all had fun and we all got along. And, um, and then there was the, the element of, of course, experimenting with psychedelics. Right. Um, Actually, I wanted to ask about that because you mentioned a minute ago that your dad was kind of part of that first 60s generation that was, you know, taking acid. And I think there a lot of the, um, you know, popular mythology around acid then that was being uh, promulgated by people like Timothy Leary was that this is a revolutionary drug. If everyone takes it, the world will be a better place. You know, there's a potential for real a massive social shift to, to be fueled by LSD and mushrooms, for example. That didn't exactly happen. As we all know now, trip, having a great trip doesn't necessarily make you a better person or more empathetic or more progressive or anything like that. Um, but now we're kind of going through a renaissance of psychedelic culture right now. And I know you've uh, been interested in that. And so, you know, as someone who's kind of got their finger on the pulse of that world a little bit, do you feel like there's anything we can learn from like your dad's generation or our generation of ravers that was just, you know, 
doing ungodly amounts of drugs in the 90s uh that like maybe like okay now it's like i think people are approaching these drugs a little bit more seriously a little bit more intentionally mm -hmm. um do you think that this psychedelic renaissance is more do you feel like there's a potential for political change with it or is this more about like kind of individualistic self-healing and sort of that side of the equation i mean if we look at cannabis right and what's happened with cannabis since the 90s um which is when i started consuming and um you know it was very much illegal uh it was like my dad one of my dad's biggest fears that i was going to get caught um you know Car carrying weed because he knew that me and my brother smoked weed um and so if you look at how that has changed culture um and industry you know i think that a lot of people you know wonder like is that kind of like setting you know setting the tone for the psychedelics now psychedelics are very different you know um i think they need a lot more guidance and they do need more introspection and that's why it, it has it is a long time coming and there's all these clinical trials and Michael Pollan actually just released um a documentary about his book how you can change your mind and so I think this getting there's all this information that's being revealed and it's nothing new for people who have been in this world and, or experimented or been interested in this world um but I, I think the world can definitely benefit from the medicinal elements of psychedelics um you know I think it, versus like alcohol right mm. um something that's been around for so long too and has you know created um you know destruction for a lot of people and are there medicinal qualities to alcohol like you know <laughs> so i think yes it's a really exciting time i have been following it you know through publications like double blind and um you know kind of on the sidelines and uh i think it, it, it creates a shift individually for a lot of people and there the teachings now are about safety and uh, harm reduction and that was missing <laughs> from my experience I was missing from my dad's experience mm -hmm. we survived <laughs> yeah yeah um and so for these you know upcoming generations I'm really excited yeah. for them um you know I'm, I'm a mom and so I, I just think it'll be approached differently there'll be a lot more information good information this time um it'll be but then you know but then the whole question about you know like big pharma coming in right and like mm -hmm. that that's what yeah, makes me yeah. nervous because i'm like you can't create a synthetic i mean you can they are right. creating synthetic psilocybin and stuff like that but it's just like oh just leave it alone just like let's like yeah, we let the plants right. like let's like get to the plants finally you know yeah yeah well, I want to, um, I mean, there's just so much to think about there, but I want to make sure I get some questions in here for Jose, because I haven't checked in with you yet, and it's been a little while since we talked. So um, since I've sort of been asking everyone about how their kind of, you know, the passions of their youth, uh, music, raving, et cetera, influenced uh, their kind of political trajectory, I want to talk to you a little bit about skateboarding, which is something you cover quite a bit in this book. Um, you started skating at a young age, you're still doing it now. How did being a skater influence the way that you sort of viewed the world? And like, what did you learn then that you still kind of carry with you today from For that sure. perspective? Yeah, I mean, um, being a skater, skateboarding, you know, like becoming a raver or becoming an activist is this entire world, you know what I mean? But I think um, similar to raving, there is a different relationship with physical space that's very interesting to explore when you're like a skateboarder in terms of cities or even in more vacant areas you know like how skateboarding street skateboarding in particular like how that self-generates and how it creates like a, a reciprocal relationship with you and a, and a city so i started skateboarding in 1996 so we're kind of dovetailing from that post nirvana 
major label investment like Veruca Salt on the radio you know what I mean things are kind of weird like, and then we're getting into like and like the movie goes about to kind of come out and try and interpret rave culture right you know the WB is we black instead instead of was black you know we're kind of in this like transition model in pop culture so skateboarding was really weird because it represented all these things and it was on the rise to Tony Hawk pro skater mm -hmm. and this whole new big invitation to uh more communities of color frankly more diverse socioeconomic backgrounds because now it's in your console so now in 2022 and seeing trans center brands queer center brands like in skateboarding seeing women and men in the olympics which is an entire another <laughs> conversation you know um the concept of rebellion and skateboarding is really interesting now mm -hmm. because it's on the podium right um but it took complete illegality to get there you know you can, <laughs> Like, so, which is really interesting to think about. But I love the Venn diagrams of like activism. It took co complete illegality, illegality to get to a lot of good places. So <laughs> skateboarding is not alone there. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Hey, you know, one thing I was wondering about is, um, you know, like I said, you're still skating. Uh, you know, you're probably out there skating and seeing kids who are in their teens and their 20s, etc. And like when we were kids skating, so I, I skated too as a teenager, you would like never see someone in their 30s or 40s or 50s even skating. And now it's not that uncommon. So I am kind of curious about that sort of intergenerational conversation in the skateboarding world. Like when you're out and you see, you know, people who are like 15 or 20, are they interested in sort of hearing what the older generations of skaters have to say? Or are they kind of just like, you know, you do your thing, you know, old man, like we're going to be over here doing our thing. It really depends on, on the where, you know what I mean? Cause certain skate parks have certain cultures where that's more, uh, I think kind of encouraged. And then there's, there's a lot of street skate spots that are like designed to be United Nations, you know, where all generations, all genders, all sexualities are welcomed. Rock Ridge Bart station in Oakland is a, the example of that, I think, you know, in terms of California right now, um, where, you know, you do have someone who was pro in the 80s hanging out with someone who just got their first board 20 minutes ago, and they're chatting and they're chopping it up, and not in a top down way, you know, just in the, how does it feel? You know, yeah. kind of way. Yeah. Um, so it really depends, you know, I, I just moved out to Sacramento, it's been about a year now, and seeing the scene here, which has to respond so much to climate, you know, all the old Barneys and all the little kids are just hiding in the shade all the time, just yeah. trying to like stay cool. Oh so there's gosh. a lot of different like moments that bring people together and skateboarding in general, it's like, you know, I think one thing that I think the older generation is trying to kind of encourage the young people about is like, if you're like, don't skate with AirPods on in a crowded skate park, you know what I mean? Mm. Like say hello to people, you know what I mean? Like be present in this physical space. You could be on your phone anywhere kind of thing. So mm. I'd be you know there's that kind of encouragement from the older heads which is cool but um i think in general there's a lot more zines and publications now too that are doing this a lot of youtube channels uh, like jeff grosso's love letters to skateboarding i think educate a lot of people um so there's a lot more digital resources for kids to go and dig in the crates and figure out why their favorite pro is doing what they're doing in a sense like what's the historical context yeah very cool very cool well, speaking of um, historical context, Mark, in your book, um, it's a great book, but it's like 150 pages and you're trying to cover like the entire history of protests, which we could cover, you know, thousands and thousands of pages. So one of the things I'm wondering about is how you sort of narrowed it down to the, you know, 30, 35 or so different specific protests and social movements that you covered and related to that, like, you know, obviously we're trying to aim it at, you um, you know, ideas that would be relevant for the youth, since this is, that's your, you know, audience for this book, but I'm wondering which chapters from talking to your readers have resonated the most with the kids who are picking it up and checking it out. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it was a very difficult um, choice, especially because there isn't something like this out there to model it on. So I spent a lot of time in the library um, looking through things. And I, I think I was attracted to, um, but personally, I was attracted to uh, protest. The story of protest in this country is the story of introducing diversity, um, you know, kind of the, the struggle against, uh, you know, the struggle to not have straight white 
rich males dominate the conversation in politics. Um, so telling the story was just a wonderful way to, um, you know, as Jose said, the, the integrate so many different sexualities, races, ethnicities, um, uh, points of view. Um, so, so really, I zeroed into each step that it took from Native American protests, which have, have happened for, you know, almost 500, 600 years now, um, through to, um, you know, right up to Black Lives Matter um, happening. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that I that I hit all those notes of diversity that were happening. Uh, personally, the things that I resonated with were um, kind of what Samantha and Jose have talked about, where you make your own space, um, mm. you make these autonomous zones, um, you know, in protests when they are able to carve out this this kind of space of possibility. Um, you know, it just resonates, and it's kind of almost like each protest past that glowing ball to the next protest to continue with it, you know, which, uh, which is really neat. Um, yeah, you know, that, that reminds me, like, when I first moved to the Bay, like, 20 years ago, um, reclaim the streets parties right. were a big <laughs> thing. And for people who don't remember those, it's kind of almost feels quaint now, because, like, the idea was that this was, like, way before parklets, there wasn't even that many bike lanes. And it was, I think, people trying to, like, be very mm -hmm. um, vocal about like actually taking back public space and having doing something fun and spontaneous and joyful there and even um i helped uh organize a couple in san francisco and they weren't always just about like hey we're gonna set up you know turntables in the middle of the street and have a dance party but sometimes it would be like we're gonna um protest like the muni fair hike by like having a street party and like people will come out and dance but then we'll also be passing out flyers so like i love that idea of like you know as we've been you know coming back to this theme again and again in this conversation of like having fun and taking up space can also be like a great way to like meet people and spread ideas and especially before social media when you couldn't just like post something on twitter or TikTok and expect everyone to find it totally and i think that's that's a really good point because a lot of people think that a protest it has only one purpose, and that's to change it. And if the protest doesn't immediately change the world, then it's a failed protest somehow. But protests are all about getting out and meeting with people, building networks, exercise, getting out in the fresh <laughs> air, yes. you know, seeing people face to face, passing on those things, even internet protests where you, you know, you just get to connect with other people in in, in a human way. Um, and you know, I, and it's funny that you mentioned like, uh, you know, the reclaiming the streets. Um, it's so interesting as um, Samantha was talking about kind of what happened with cannabis and how, you know, legalization has kind of tamed it and made it into this big business um, kind of thing. I look at the those original protests and things like critical mass, where yeah. it was like actually taking over the streets or, you know, a number of street protests throughout history that have blocked streets, blocked bridges and everything. Um, and now that's kind of been not gentrified, but normalized into slow streets, into what's mm, happening with JFK mm -hmm. Drive here, where families yeah. are going out and, you know, it's recreation. So it's really interesting to see the evolution of how something is so radical. And then a few years later, it becomes a family activity, um, which protests also are, you know, so. Absolutely. And I think, you know, I mean, like, you know, Jose was talking about with skateboarding being in the Olympics, there's sort of, uh, you know, whole conversations we had about our sort of sub-legal uh, passions being kind of co-opted or embraced by the mainstream, you know, there's good way, like, you know, and like Sam was saying with psychedelics, like, there's certainly benefits to these things becoming part of mainstream culture, but, uh, you know, as you put it, they can, you know, taming them is, it can kind of smooth off those edges that make them so exciting and, and relevant and politically challenging as well, right? Because I mean, look what happened with the parklets. Um, at first it was like, cool, people can actually eat outside. And then it's like, oh, but it's basically privatizing public sidewalks and like making them unsafe spaces for maybe homeless people that used to live on those sidewalks. Mm. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, there's, those, there's definitely those considerations of how protest becomes legitimized, um, you know, going back, of course, here to the 60s, as you were talking with Samantha about and her father, where what was once kind of wild and out on the streets is now sold to us um, in many iterations after iterations after iterations. I mean, I think we're on the 30th time that flares have come back, you know, right now. So, <laughs> And one of the things yes. I loved about Samantha's book so much was her detailing of the fashion of Brave yes. um, and how much that put into 
into it and that just like you know was was a proustian madeline and taking me right back <laughs> oh my gosh yes and the, the samantha your book was also just so like no uh like holding no punches you were really upfront about sort of the ups and downs of your life as a, as a raver girl and um I, I you know you i think you're the only person on this panel who has a child who's um, a parent right now. And so I'm wondering, um, as you raise, you know, uh, your son, um, you know, how are you going to sort of balance out that, um, you know, wanting him to kind of have the sort of exciting, rebellious experiences that you had when you were a young person growing up versus the sort of parental instinct to not want anything bad to happen to your kid. Because like, I'm thinking back to my youth, like, you know, running from cops, doing acid, all this stuff. It was like fun and formative, but like people got hurt, people got in trouble. And like, if I was a dad, I don't know if I'd want my kids like out doing, you know, raising the hell, <laughs> raising that kind of hell that, you know, we used to do in my day. <laughs> 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 I know. Yeah. Um, yeah, I get asked this a lot. Um, and, you know, and I think about it a lot. It's, and, uh, you know, I think about, um, you know, right now he's four and a half. And so I don't have to worry about <laughs> um, society and bad influences and social media and, all, you know, everything that's going to come. Um but I also, that time for me was really formative in just like my attitude and, you know, I'm, I'm pretty lax when it comes to things and, you know, I have my morals, um, but I'm pretty open-minded to like, I, you know, it, creatively too. Uh, you know, I think for me, I really learned what a creative person I was, you know, that, kind of being a teenager and hormonal and self-conscious had really like oppressed my creativity and when I entered the world of rave I was able to be my like kooky creative self and then of course you know take these substances that actually really did open my doors of perception and I attribute you know this kind of really complex creativity that I can have I, I think some of it is, you know, from doing psychedelics at such a young age. And so, you know, the, the jury's still out on his personality <laughs> type. I yeah. mean, he's four and a half. He's really smart um, and really kooky, as a lot of four-year-olds are. Um, I do secretly hope he's not going to be into that stuff. <laughs> um, so, you know, we don't really have to deal with it, but who knows? Um, but, yeah. but if he, if he is, you know, I feel like I have a wealth of knowledge and I will be, you know, very open with him and um, just makes, and like I said, there's all these resources now. Right. Um, I yeah. mean, there's actually, you know, dance safe and there's people at, you know, the, the festivals and the raves now who are providing so much more um first aid and safety and you know <laughs> compared to the underground you know the dangerous you know places and spaces that yeah yeah we rave in. by the time your son is like of partying age like micro doses might be available at walgreens the way things are going I know. you know it's like, like it may not so. even be like a big deal you know and yeah with the kombucha it's like the kombucha yeah. stuff, <laughs> yeah. you know what i mean yeah like, Yo, exactly. you, you got your psilocybin kombucha you know definitely like, um, yeah <laughs> Get, get some things, like, get some DMT at the drive through on the way to the spa. I know. It's really, <laughs> it, that's why, that's why I've been, I mean, that's not why I've been following what's going on in, yeah. you know, in the psychedelic world. Um, but, you know, I, it's, it's, it's my own personal, you know, experience and curiosity still. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you told me in the nineties that cannabis was going to be, you know, I secretly hoped, I think we all hoped it would, you know, and we knew we were like, it's, it can be so therapeutic and it can be, you know, I was medic self-medicating mm -hmm. um, as a teenager, didn't even really realize yeah. it. Yeah. Um, and so it was really exciting when all that unfolded, you know, over the last 10 years. So it'll be exciting to see what unfolds with this. And I think Absolutely. it's certainly, you know, can help so many people who would not even consider it before. And, you know, with mental health crisis and, you know, there's just Definitely. so many other people who could benefit from it. Absolutely. 
Well, yeah. um, you know, my my specialty is Oakland history, East Bay history. So, you know, I got to get one Oakland history related question here. And this next one is coming at you, Jose. So um, I've told you this before, but the, the essay in your book that I resonated most with was uh, your chapter about living in downtown Oakland in your early 20s, mm -hmm. which was kind of like right before the giant kind of post uh, Great Recession tech bubble uh, that really um, changed everything. I mean, so much more development, gentrification, displacement, rising rents, etc. So your book came out about a year ago or so. Um, you've had a chance to talk to a lot of readers about it. And I'm wondering what kind of feedback you've been getting about that topic specifically. Like, are you hearing from kind of, you know, I'm sure that you're hearing from like, you know, old heads like me who are like, oh yeah, downtown Oakland, it's not what it used to be. But also I'm curious if you're hearing from any younger people who are like, wow, like you could afford an apartment in Oakland for $400 a month, you know, right out of college, which seems like magical now, but back then was a lot of money. So yeah, I'm kind of wondering like how younger people are responding to that chapter and and, uh, and the rest of your book as well. For sure. Yeah, I think, well, there's there's a couple of different reactions. Definitely the 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 kind of price of living, like, like the, the rent price alone, I think is it's kind of jarring for folks, both like sharing a spot with two other people, the people that we took over the apartment from just finessed an amazing deal. But regardless, like it's just the type of downtown Oakland that was going down, you know, at that time was, I don't want to say volatile, but there's a lot of things happening all at once that were leading up to kind of things that you saw in Occupy and, and, and beyond. But um, I think a lot of people, especially like folks in East Bay have kind of responded with like a lot of love to that piece and a lot of like even if they weren't old enough to experience that they were like oh yeah my uncle or my cousin or someone I know used to live downtown or lived in the area or says that x y or z is very different a lot of people a lot of a particularly young person at one of the readings said that they didn't know that the um 14th street had been like renovated like they kind of mm. thought like, the amphitheater and everything that's there it's like even if like little things like that are interesting uh, but then it's also been people that are like, oh, yeah, like I was there. Like, I remember when that bar owner like pulled out a, you know, shotgun. Like, I remember all these things, you know. Oh, shotgun uh, Phil. Yeah. Yeah. Because you yeah. read about the Oscar Grant riots That's and protests it. as well, which was like a yeah. really pivotal moment in, in, in downtown. And like you said, kind of set the stage for Occupy, I think, and a lot of the Black Lives Matter movement and things that came after. So such an important era. And there's a lot of like parallel kind of histories being told too. Like there's like the Alice Street film, you know, like about mm -hmm. like 14th and, and Alice. Like, so there's a lot of things that like interstate, I think is kind of also like trying to be in conversation with, you know what I mean? Like including your work, Liam, frankly. And like, nice. you know, like just trying to be aware of things. And also like things have kind of changed. Like the Chauncey Bailey, um, you know, plaque that I mentioned not being there, the book now is there, like, you know, in the wake of this new mm -hmm. development. So like, there's all these kind of active histories, but I think a lot of people, have responded positively to it. When I read the work, a lot of people immediately tell me like their relationship to California, mm -hmm. I've noticed. Um, the first time I ever read anything from this book was at Wolfman Books on, you know, in like- mm. I, I miss that place, place so much. Yeah, and the, the wood, I can hear the wood creaking floors, you know? Yeah. Uh, you know, like just immediately people were just like, oh yeah, I did, you know, I'm from Nevada City, I'm from, you know, uh, like Imperial Valley. So like immediately people tell me their relationship with California, which is really interesting or their relationship with Oakland, you know? Um, mm -hmm. So, but I found that even with people that have just moved to, to Oakland or to the Bay Area, they kind of come with it like with an amount of respect. Like they're kind of like, I know that there's something here before me and this helps me understand what was here before me. So like knowing that there's people yeah. that are already like curious enough to know that there's a before, is really encouraging. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I could like go around asking you guys questions all day. I do have more questions, but I want to make sure that we have some time for the audience to ask some questions too. So I don't know if um, we can take one from the audience chat now, if anyone has a question. And if we don't, you know, I've got, like I said, I've got plenty in my arsenal, but I want to give, give the people a chance to, to make their voice heard as well. Yeah, I haven't. No one has posted anything in the chat space yet. Well, I can I, I can ask one. Oh, unless you were going to say something. No, I was just going to say that I'll, you know, please uh, making the service announcement, please put in the chat if you have any questions. 
Um, and uh, we have such a small group, you can ask your question directly. I can turn your mic on if you want, or I can read your question in the chat space. It's up to you. But if you have any questions, just let me know. And in the meantime, uh, Liam, why don't you go ahead and ask one of your backup questions? Well, so one of the things I was wondering about, um, because I, I do want to make sure that we um, have some kind of like, you know, inspirational or uplifting moments of this conversation, because I do feel like it's really easy these days to get down when when you're looking around at all the various uh, apocalyptic scenarios kind of looming on the horizon from, you know, uh, lack of reproductive rights in a lot of this country to, you know, climate change, etc. So I'm wondering, you know, if you guys can talk a little bit about what is giving you hope right now in terms of what you're seeing in youth culture like what's bubbling up from the zoomers from gen z that's making you think that like they're going to have a positive impact on on some of these crises i mean obviously uh, i'll jump in obviously um you know internet activism has evolved you know and and for me seeing how fast knowledge travels and how fast reactions are and how uh you know how quickly words gets out via TikToks, um you know via group chats etc that that kind of organizing um which is also reflected in what's happening in a lot of workplaces now where there's you know unionization drives going on um there are people willing to pour into the streets as we saw uh, when Roe was uh, reversed, especially young women um, taking charge of these kind of things. Um, that, you know, seeing people both on the streets and sharing this knowledge in this new technology um, with humor. I mean, people are funny. People put, hold up the big part of it is holding up a funny sign. People love to do that, you know, and so that I, I just love seeing that still happening. All right, yeah. there's a question. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Samantha. Do you have a rebuttal? Oh, I was just gonna, yeah, I was just, I don't have a rebuttal. <laughs> I have an addition. Um, yeah, I was recently reading about a, a really young um, climate change advocate. And um, I, that this is, that's one of like my biggest concerns uh, as an adult and especially like having a child and, um, so yeah, so that was really reassuring to hear that. And she's like, I think she's like 19 or 20 and she has a huge social media following. And so I think, you know, as, you know, as much as I roll my eyes at social media, <laughs> and, um, when I see young people using it for good, I am so relieved. So I'm like, okay, there is hope, you know, and some people are using this for good and, um, you know, I, I, yeah, so climate change, I'm feeling, you know, a, well, it's hard because it's like very much real and happening. Um, but I, you know, and then just like, I, I'm kind of obsessed with coming of age and high school <laughs> shows and movies. I'm always watching them. And yeah, and, and just the, even, and I know it's television. Um, but these topics that are coming up um, for teenagers, I'm like, wow, okay, like they're, you know, even as teenagers, they're aware of these things that like, I was so not, you know, like I was a raver girl, I was so in my, my bubble. And it's kind of like, I don't know, I'm sure there's still kids who are in their bubbles, but it's like, how can you not be aware of all these things that have happened, you know, in the past five years, um, and even during the pandemic? And um, just so much more, like, so much more realized about, you know, politics and, you know, gender equality and like all of that. It was like kind of like I was soaking it in when I was a teenager, but like, you know, we weren't really talking about it and it wasn't a part of the conversation. Um, I feel like it's very much part of the conversations I'm, you know, witnessing. And if I ever like when I, you know, when I'm out in public and I, <laughs> I see youngins, I like always eavesdrop. I'm like totally that, that person. I'm like, what are they talking about? So, um, yeah, they are talking about, you know, some important things. So. All right. So it looks like uh, a question just popped up in the chat about 
someone requested Kay Davis requesting um, a discussion about the current state of online communities for the local rave dance organizing culture. It seems like there's no obvious success successors to SF raves, tribe, ground score, et cetera. Facebook, Twitter seem like pill replacements for the vibrant forms of the past. Mark, that kind of feels like a question that you might be ready to answer I mean you you still go to an astonishing amount of parties I'm always like when I when I see you know follow you on social media and I'm like wow how do you keep up with all this it's impressive so how are you finding out about things what are the online communities where people can sort of plug in Sure. I mean, I think what's happening right now is we're going through the great Facebook collapse where everybody's promotion for events went to Facebook in the mid, uh, you know, 2010s. Um, and then as people got disillusioned over the past four years and left Facebook, they um, gradually it all fell apart. Um, one of the most touching things that happened to me last year in the darkest time of the pandemic was someone actually handed me a flyer to a party which i hadn't seen and i wasn't quite sure what to do with it um you know i hadn't seen it in a while um and you know i think this return to physical media is happening um as well as uh you know a lot of uh, there is a return happening right now of after hours and extra legal parties, which I'm amazed at and, and find very hopeful. Some of them are a little, you know, not not quite my scene, um, but a lot of them are are just really, you know, there's a lot of trans rave parties that are happening and very nurturing of that scene. Um, you know, a lot of gender nonconforming kind of raves that are happening, which I love and DJs coming forth. And I think they've built their own um uh, you know, networks of communication, which is wonderful via group chats, um, via on less public facing um, things. So the point, I mm -hmm. mean, I guess the point of what I'm saying is you kind of need to know somebody now. Mm -hmm. um, and if you want to make a flyer, that's the most wonderful thing in the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, what about in the skateboarding world, Jose? Is there like a lot of... Um... Like, are there are there forums still where people kind of are like organizing and getting into stuff or is it more sort of like private group chats or how are because like I know in San Francisco, for example, they organize that crazy hill bomb in, oh. in front of Dolores Park every year and that's there's no flyers for that that the public is getting so how are kind of uh, people, uh, you know, collectively organizing things in the skateboarding world these days. Yeah, and the Dolores hill bomb is a, is a great example of something that was started by a local crew that then gets abandoned by that crew and it gets taken by whoever wants it you know what I mean so mm -hmm. it's kind of like that that's a official shit show at this point um so it's like so knows? it sort of went down the Santa con trajectory then yeah it got it <laughs> kind of got broified yeah actually that's a perfect example yeah basically and so you know but you know um to Mark's point earlier about social media and its role to, uh, to a previous question, I think the answer to this one is that like a lot of people still show up in real time, like zine fests are popping, book fairs are popping, like analog presentations meet, you know, with like events is still like a big thing, you know, and maybe that's a kind of just the, the power of the forms themselves. But within skateboarding, you know, social media has been that mechanism that has propelled things like Unity Skateboarding, which is you know, we're going to show up at this spot, we're going to make it a queer, safe, and inclusive space for them from this time to this time, show up, get free boards, and, you know, whatever. That's now, like, a, an official company that's part of, like, the industry proper, you know what I mean, that sells boards you can get at your local skate shop. So social media is a huge mechanism for that. The ironic thing about skateboarding is that skateboarding is all driven by brands. So it's almost like mm. consumerism on steroids, like Unity and their skateboards are brands that center it around trans skateboarding. So when you open up a skate magazine, you're following brands to tell you what is skateboarding, like, you know, this, mm. this, this, this trick down this hill. And now with social media, skaters are kind of taking back the reins from the bigger companies and saying like, no, this is what skateboarding is. We do it like this in these spaces. Another big thing that's happening is that skaters are taking the initiative to not only build and design skate parks in their communities, which has been going on since the 90s, when there was like a dearth of skate parks. Um, but now they're doing it in these really kind of inclusive community space ways where it's like, say there's two tennis courts that are abandoned, otherwise abandoned. Just give us this corner and allow us to create this space that you can sit on maybe at night or maybe early in the morning when people aren't there. But when the skaters are there, we can use it as our own thing. So it's kind of like, 
you know, an equal playing field between giving the traditional sports their big outdoor playing fields and something that we will actually skate and not another big blocky kind of traditional skate park that now you're seeing in the Olympics, right? So skaters yeah, are yeah. like consistently using digital to like bring people together in real time, in the real space and still have that face to face. So, um, and even when you show up to the spot today, you still see flyers, you know, posted to the pillars and stuff like that. So, oh, yeah, um, that's awesome. You know, if you build cool. it, come. Well, one thing that I was wondering about for all you guys is, you know, when you grow up in these kind of like youth subcultures like raving or punk or skateboarding, you know, I'm sure we all have a lot of friends who kind of like dropped out, grew out of the scene, right? Uh, started adulting or whatever the lingo is these days. But obviously we're all holding on to, you know, some things that we've been excited about since we were teenagers. And I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, you know, you can go overboard, you know, <laughs> in terms of like holding on to your, your teenage years. But I think there's a way, a good way of finding that balance and, um, you know, still holding on to some of the things that you've been passionate about your entire life. So I'm wondering if you can all talk a little bit about like what keeps you going, like what makes you still want to skate or, you know, dance or listen to, you know, um, techno or like whatever, like the thing is that sort of you're still excited about the these aspects that shaped you as a youth like how are they still affecting you as an adult what makes you you know want to hold on to that so strongly i think just on this on the skateboarding tip really quick i think it's the desire to kind of be good at something that you're obsessed at like but it's mm. also as like you get older just finding your lane you know um you're not going to jump down 10 stairs without uh, taking out some serious days off of work, you know what I mean? So <laughs> and uh, life insurance policy, life maybe insurance too. Policy. <laughs> right. Yeah. We take my own death to get <laughs> hospitals all cleared. You know, you just have to find your way really. Um, but I think it's the impact of these things that I think about constantly. Like, why is it that all these, but I think these, these different cultures that resonated with us are all like microcosmic of all these other, they house so many different worlds, you know, like art, music, Present clothing style, the way you talk to your friends. So, you know, how how can't you be impacted by this world that, like I think about Samantha's book, you know, when she takes people to the Raven Santa Cruz and some of them have been to it before and some of them, or most of them hadn't. So it's like opening the door to like out, you know, to the, to the wonderland, you know, like um, you, you just got to find your lane and as you get older with that inspiration kind of alongside you. Yeah, um, I I do not attend raves anymore in my nightlife, um, because mainly because I have a four and a half year old son. However, I did recently go before I moved um, a couple months ago. There was a sun the sunset crew who used to throw the sunset day parties on Sundays at the end of long weekends for a lot of people. Um, they threw day party and um i was like i told my husband i was like we're gonna go to this and we're gonna bring donovan it says it's like family friendly and um and it was the beautiful lagoon the lagoon park and like san rafael and it was just like a perfect day and i had a couple friends uh, from back in the day uh who i told and they went and it and it was because it was daytime um it it reminded me of what i you know of what i loved about this scene and it was the music the people and just like the energy and so when i when i'm like oh gosh i'm like such a like boring mom now i'm like i could always just like put on that music and like <laughs> go dance in a room in my house and like I can just get back to that space like I don't need the drugs like you know I've experienced it fully um as you know if you've read the book and so I think it's just yeah I think it's it's easy to transport myself back to like the essence of why I love this um and that's really exciting and even just the music can do it um so, you know, I think it's, it's, and it is, it's, 
it's something that I didn't like talking about for a long time. Like in my twenties, I had a lot of shame. I was like, oh my God, I was crazy. I was horrible to my parents. Um, but now, I mean, obviously I'm, I'm an open book about it, but because I also accepted it's such a part of who I am and mm -hmm. who I became um, g good and bad, you know? Yeah. Yeah. What about you, Mark? Um, I mean, personally, um, I'm really glad that uh, techno music and electronic uh, music is so geeky that, you know, you can like I often get together with my friends and we talk about the fact that 30 years ago we would be ham radio nuts or model airplane <laughs> people because we're just geeking out about machinery and yeah. sounds and things like that. Yeah. And that's, that's obviously uh, just one aspect of it. Um, and then, you know, I mean, that was a big question that came that came to my mind often during the book was there's this youthful energy of rebellion, you know, kind of like, uh, you know, ca encapsulized in the hippie movement, et cetera. Um, but, you know, present long before that, where does that go? You know, where does mm -hmm. that spirit go? And have we built, you know, such a capitalistic society and uh, such a materialist society that responsibility of later life just means these crushing burdens that do not enable us uh, to live our ecstatic free lives. Um, you know, there's a lot of prejudice against older, you know, as I transition into a rave elder, I suddenly come face to face with the fact that, oh my gosh, I laughed at the 60 year old who was dancing at the rave in the 90s. And now I'm going to be that person. <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of realized. Well, the like, nice thing about the Bay Area is that you still won't be the oldest person there because there's so many Peter yeah. Pans in this city <laughs> <laughs> that's so true that's so true and you know i mean uh, so it's kind of it's kind of a funny situation to be in but um thank god is for those people you know even though the peter pan thing can get to be a little much um you know just the i'm so glad there's people who are still on the margins and outside of uh willing to endure the prejudices to do their own thing I guess absolutely <laughs> absolutely and I'm, I'm sure you saw the there was like a tweet that went like a screenshot of a tweet that went viral like a month or two ago in a lot of uh, kind of um, raver social media forums about like, oh, people over 30 should be banned from music festivals. And the person who posted that got like ratioed so hard. I think the vast majority of people agree with you that, you know, no matter how old you are, if you're there for a good time and you enjoy the music, like it's an accepting place. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, hopefully, you know, we create these spaces that are safe for everyone, um, you know, race age you know gender uh, everything you know just if, if you're having a good time you're, you're welcome to come and and have fun um do we have any more questions from the chat or i know it's about seven o'clock so i don't want to keep us on here all night long but i, I don't want to skip anyone if there was any people in the queue Um, I don't see anyone in the queue. However, there was someone who was, uh, oh, it looks like they've popped out, but there was an anonymous attendee who had a question, but um, they didn't post it in the chat after all. So. Um, cool. I'm just dropping those links in one more time in case anyone missed them. Those are the links to the previous interviews with Jose and Samantha, as well as that great conversation between Mark and Vivian on Rave for the Grave, where you just described some parties that I wish I had gone to, <laughs> that major FOMO listening to that interview. Yeah. But so will that do it for this evening then? Was there anything else anyone else wanted to uh, mention before we wrap things up? All right. Well, no. I think... That yeah. was fun. And uh, thanks for recording this and hosting. And I'm glad that it'll be up on YouTube soon for anyone that missed it, uh, because my mom was curious about that. And I want to make sure that. Uh... <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, mom. To check this out. Hi, mom. <laughs> yes, I will send the link to all of our Eventbrite registrants, and then I'll send it to um, you folks directly through email. So you can. Um, Share it around as much as you want or post it on your own website. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Thank you so Thanks much again. for coming out tonight. And I look forward to seeing you downtown or in the at the mechanics directly. Excellent. Thank All you. Right. So Good night, much. everybody. Take Thank care. You. Good night. Good night. Bye.